Hey there, welcome back to episode six. This one is going to be a roller coaster, so strap in and get ready for some mind bending. Today, I will be talking about one of Florence's most influential and worshipped saints. Of course, none other than Maria Maddalena de Pazzi. Now, I am going to put out a trigger warning mainly because I will be talking about certain topics that are kind of dark. Maria's story is, is not vanilla, to say the least. So, if, if you don't like anything, you know, anything violent, I, I would not listen to this episode so yeah there, there's a there's a heads up in case you don't like that so yes now her background Maria Maddalena de Pazzi was born on Saturday 2nd of April 1566 so yeah she was an Aries if she were alive today she would be around 454 years old so quite ancient so yeah let's get into it she was born in the Duchy of Florence Italy obviously into the family of Camillo di Geri di Pazzi and Maria Buondelmonti. Her father was part of one of the wealthiest, or I guess you could call it prominent families in the Renaissance era of Florence. Now, Maria had a decent childhood. You know, she grew up fairly religious. And at the age of nine is when things took a turn. Like, they went left, I tell you. Um, at the age of nine, family chaplain taught her how to meditate. And there was a specific technique that came from the book called The Passion of Christ. Now, I warn you, things are about to get a little descriptive. So if you don't particularly like pain or self-inflicted pain, I would skip ahead around 20 to 30 seconds. Simultaneously, she started practicing what we call mortification of flesh, which simply put is the attempt to get rid of sin, whether spiritually or in a more physical context, by putting yourself through pain. Insert here that one scene from Da Vinci Code because what the hell, I will never get rid of that scene in my head. Psychologically, I cannot, but oh my days, whatever. If you've seen that with the that white dude with white hair, God, that scene was, oh God, I'm having flashbacks. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. Her method of getting rid of her sinful nature uh, was through one of the most common practices which was self-flagellation, which is the act of hitting yourself with a flog or a whip, not in a Fifty Shades of Grey type of way. It is said that this is used in the context of spiritual discipline, but who knows, any rational, well, if rational actually exists, you know, but whatever, any rational human would kind of think, whoa, what the hell, self-torture? No, thank you. And most people would think that self-flagellation would be enough, it's more than enough in my opinion. But nope, not Maria. She decided to up this discipline through the use of a seal, aka a sackcloth, right? Which is kind of like a vest or in some cases underwear. Basically undergarments in general. Made of a coarse cloth or animal hair, which is obviously extremely uncomfortable. This kind of vest slash undergarment thing is put onto bare skin. So yes, completely butt-ass naked. <laughs> and wore under regular clothing. The whole point of this thing, you may ask? Well, the point is to irritate and cause wounding to the skin. Yeah, I wouldn't do it either, but oh well. Oh, so you thought that was it? <laughs> nope. Not only did she wear this, but hers was made of barbed wire. Chicken wire. <laughs> no. She also frequently used a DIY crown of thorns made to imitate the one obviously worn by Christ during his crucifixion. Yeah, let's move on. Now, let's get into the, I guess, the more interesting part because that, that, that last part, trauma. Uh, we're going to get into the whole religious ecstasy thing which is so interesting to me. So a year later, when she turned 10, she received her first communion and made a vow of virginity that same year, which I never understood why people are so obsessed with virginity, but uh, oh well, you know, it's church. Two years later is when she started getting her first few religious ecstasies. Her first one was actually right in front of her mother. Yeah, because that's not awkward at all. Just in case you don't know what a religious ecstasy is, is when an individual is in an altered state of consciousness, which in turn greatly reduces any type of like external or more so, I guess you could call it physical awareness, while simultaneously increasing psychological or internal spiritual awareness. In this type of altered state, people typically experience visions and emotional euphoria. Basically, she just she was tipping the scale from the 3D to the 5D. 
from then on she would begin and continuously experience many varied mystical experiences in the year 1580 maria had now turned 14 and she wished to be entered into a monastery to which her father obliged just as she had been entered though a nobleman had asked for her hand in marriage but she completely refused she was completely accepted at the monastery and was given the name of sister mary magdalene her first year went by fairly quickly and in retrospect was going quite smoothly you know until she suddenly became critically ill upon receiving her religious daily habit of discipline the nuns at the monastery asked her how she could bear so much pain which is the question I think we all have in our heads right now. To which she happily replied, those who call to mind the sufferings of Christ and who offer up their own to God through his passion find their pains sweet and pleasant. Yes, she called self-torture sweet and pleasant. Now, everyone in the monastery could feel that death was, death was approaching Maria, sadly. So what they had her do was make her religious vows in private while she lay in a cot in a chapel. Some say she actually healed from her first fall of illness, and this was then followed for 40 days of religious ecstasy, which would begin just after mass. It is said that she would fall into ecstasy for around two hours every day, sometimes more, which she would describe as excess of love. To avoid any type of speculation, falsifying, or just downright deception, they asked um, for all of Sister Mary Magdalene's experiences to be dictated by her and written down with the help of the other nuns. Over the course of the next six years or so, she actually writ five volumes of books which were filled with her experience. The first three contain her religious ecstasies in detail from May of 1584 or so to Pentecost week of the following year, so a whole year. Now that week in particular, so she described as a week of preparation for what was to come. So a bit of foreshadowing there for you. Now that she had experienced such divine love for over a year or so, what followed was the lion's den, aka the greatest trial and affliction of spirit, which began on the Trinity Sunday, June 16th, 1585. Now let's move on to the lion's den, shall we? Here began her real journey. Her feelings of eternal joy and religious ecstasies were close to disappearing completely. Naturally, because of this came doubt. She felt like her whole life had kind of been a mistake or that she had also chosen the wrong path, you could call it. What also followed was the temptation of running away from the monastery, leaving completely and inevitably committing suicide. And even though she occasionally did experience religious ecstasies, again, these brought merely any comfort at all. This is thoroughly explained in detail in her fourth and fifth volume. In these, she explained that while she was under some of the few religious ecstasies left, Jesus would appear before her and tell her that her purpose was to renew not only the church, but the religious life and beliefs of the church. To which she then decided that she would compose 12 letters about this throughout this period also. Now, we're approaching the end. By 1590, so a whole five years later, in the same week of Pentecost, Sister Mary Magdalene had now been freed of this long, tumultuous trial of faith. As she recovered, she moved position in her monastery multiple times, first in 95 in charge of the junior professed, then in 98 she became novel mistress, and a couple of years later in 1604 she became sub prioress. It was here when she finally ended up in bed though, extremely ill and weak. She had begun suffering of the next symptoms. These were hemorrhoids, fever, and coughing spells. She actually had such extreme headaches that she could not eat whatsoever. She could barely sleep. And I'm actually going to read you word for word how some people described her. Because several people at the time actually went to visit her and everything as she was on her bed. You know, they described her differently. But what I found funny is this one dude. Now, according to this researcher called Ian Wilson, sometimes she would wear only a single garment but she would tear this off in order to roll herself on thorns or give herself another savage beating. Wilson described Patsy as a florid sadomasochist neurotic. He called her fucking insane. Basically, to put it mildly. Other people, especially this person called Asti Hustvet, they said that Patsy wore a crown of thorns and a corset onto which she had attached piercing nails. She also walked barefoot through the snow dripped hot wax onto her body and licked the wounds of the disease including those affected with leprosy now about the age of 37 or so she had all the illnesses 
all of them like the, the, she had a whole long catalog from a to z of one of these symptoms was that her gums were super painful mainly because they were completely infected because you know she would do weird things like lick in the wounds of the diseased obviously this caused for her teeth to fall out one one by one her body was also covered with putrefying bed sores and when the sisters offered to move her she warned them off mainly because of the fear that by touching her body they might experience sexual desire a large statue of her holding a flagellant whip can be seen in the church in florence where people around the world still come to pay tribute now some people a couple of years later also like you know after knowing about her kind of diagnosed her as maybe she maybe she had you know anorexia or bulimia because they also do align with these symptoms you know moving back so yeah she had extreme headaches she could not eat she could not sleep finally on the 3rd of may 1607 after three years three to four years of being in bed she received the anointing of the sick and died 12 days later at the age of 41. now let's move on to miracles shall we <laughs> various people claim to have been blessed with miracles by some say that they have seen her also and that she has cured them of different illnesses the people of Florence also believe that she had predicted the rise to papacy of Pope Cardinal Alessandro, which in fact did come true. So there you go. A year after her burial, permission was given to move her body back into her room in the monastery. However, once it had been moved, they found that the body was completely intact. This is when the process of beatification began and she was later canonized as a saint. And yeah, that, that's the end of that faith-driven and extremely religious woman of Florence. Thank you for tuning in and let me know about any thoughts you may have according to, you know, historical figures like these. Yeah, please leave all of these down below. So yeah, hope you enjoyed it and I hope you tune in to the next episode. Thank you. Goodbye.